Good afternoon. I'm Richard Gingras, head of news at Google. And in my job, I spend a lot of time working with publishers and partners around the world. And it's such a pleasure to be here at I.O. with so many of you here in this beautiful and exquisite space. You know, not surprisingly, I'm someone who has, I've wanted to be on this stage my entire life. And as you've probably noticed, I'm not 27. So what's the lesson in that? Don't give up. Don't ever give up. <laughs> Google, as you know, has applied great focus on people use Google to discover your content and your brands. We continue to evolve our understanding of users and their intentions and interests and then connecting those users to the highest quality third-party content and services. We're proud of our symbiotic relationship with publishers and enabling users to benefit from your products. It's the web's rich ecosystem of knowledge that allows products like Google Search to have relevance and value. And it's the open platform of the web that allows publishers to easily reach out to new audiences. In that sense, I believe that Google and publishers share a common cause. We both desire a rich and open ecosystem for media distribution. Today, we all have smartphones in our pockets, smart TVs in our living rooms, and increasingly computers on our wrists in our cars woven into the very fabric of our lives. People come to Google billions of times each day to fulfill their daily information needs, whether that's catching up on the presidential election, finding nearby concerts, or, if you're me, discovering a recipe for a new cocktail. Primarily, these needs are fulfilled on mobile. In fact, more Google searches take place on mobile than on desktop. The mobile momentum, as you all know, is only increasing. By some projections, the world will have 5 billion people accessing the internet by 2020. 5 billion people. From the coffee farmer in Kenya, to the high school student in Tallinn, to my geekier friends here in this space with a half a dozen smart devices. We're building search to meet their daily needs. We want all of these users to have a great search experience so that they can discover and engage with your content. If you're a publisher, search, I'm guessing, is probably a pretty important source of traffic. As the next billion come online, it's only going to become more important. But before I tell you about all the things that Google can do today, let's take a step back and remember how Google started. Remember 1998? You probably had one of these sitting in your house. You'd go to google.com on this monster machine, type in a few words, and you'd get links to relevant websites. At the time, the experience was truly magical. The world of information at your fingertips. And today, that experience is still magical. We recognize that mobile is fundamentally different than desktop. One can't simply port the same desktop experience over to consumers' phones. The needs of our users and their mobile behaviors are so different today. How many of you have been on a desktop or laptop since arriving at I.O.? Maybe in your hotel room you used your laptop or on your flight here. Now think about how many times you've checked your phone today. On average, people check their phone 150 times a day. Among those of us in publishing or tech, it's probably even more. We twitch with stolen glances at our phones, lured back to the device for another convenient burst of digital activity. These short sessions add up. We spend 177 minutes on our phones every day, almost three hours. That means we're having mobile sessions that average more than a minute long, more than 150 times a day. And these short sessions are productive. In the past year alone, websites in the United States have seen a 29% increase in mobile conversion rates. We've completely rebuilt search for this mobile, always connected world. People want answers instantly. We're no longer sitting at desktop computers surfing the web for hours on end. 
Now we're whipping out our phones in the lunch line at the airport or while watching TV. We're searching for things that are happening right now and using many new types of devices. Let me share a video that gives a quick glimpse into Google's evolution over the past 17 years. Please run the video. When we were trying to name Google, we actually went through thousands of names. The name of the company has now become its own verb in the dictionary. Let's Google it. You can Google it. Work the Google on the internet machine. Six simple letters on a plain For white example, page. Being able to do searches in any language about any country. When you're putting in a question, they'd finish your question Google. for you. We have been working on organizing the world's information. Our goal is to digitize all the books. Today, Google announced Gmail. Email for everyone for free. Google is mapping the entire world to make it more accessible to people everywhere. Google is jumping into the mobile market. Android was built as an open platform for everyone to use and build on. This is Chrome. It's a faster, safer browser for the open web. Google is unveiling what they call the knowledge graph. We needed to understand the world the way you and I do, as objects and relationships between objects. Today, Google's got another useful feature with Google Now. We are providing you with answers before you've even asked for one them. One of my favorite cards is the one that shows traffic data for your commute to and from work. Think about how far Google has evolved from the 10 blue links. We asked ourselves, how can we assist you right when you need it? OK, Google, call the Walker Art Center. It's not just desktops, phones, and laptops anymore. OK, Google. It's watches with displays, car consoles with displays. OK, Google, let's go to the aquarium. How can we help you get things done in as few steps as possible? OK, Google. OK, Google, okay, Google. show me my photos of Lucas with the pumpkin. But we have to remember, we have a long way to go. This is just the tip of the iceberg. It's been a fabulous 17 years. We've completely rebuilt search for this mobile, always connected world. And we've come a long way, both in our abilities, our features, and the way Google looks. Google has a few new moves to go along with its new look. And let me call out just several recent launches. With our stories to read cards in Google Now, we suggest new stories based on the reader's content, contexts, and interests. Since many of the next billion users will be on slow 2G connections, we created Search Lite to ensure that users on slow networks still get a great search experience. Search Lite, by the way, uses 90% less data than standard search results. We also started using mobile friendliness as a ranking signal for mobile search results. Now searchers can more easily find high quality and relevant results that support great mobile experiences. Whether it's our election experiences or our health results, over the past few years, we've launched new features that feel right at home on a mobile device. And that's just the start. Although the device landscape has changed, search plays the same role it did in 1998, understanding a user's intent and presenting the best possible content. Users have an increasing number of needs, needs that can be answered by the content and services you provide. We're creating the tools and features that we believe will help users and publishers make the most of search in this new world. If you attended I.O. sessions over the past few years, you may be familiar with features such as app indexing, the Now API, and the voice messaging API. These features drive new ways of discovery, whether it's directing organic search traffic to your app or reaching users with third-party Now cards. Today's session is all about the new ways Google can help you grow your audience and your business. We'll discuss how you can preview fresh, real-time content in search to drive discovery and reach. We'll show you how we're leveraging accelerated mobile pages in search to provide blazingly fast experiences for all the great content you build. When your site surfaces in search, we want you to be sure it loads instantly, because if it doesn't, abandonment increases and opportunities are lost. 
And finally, we'll show you the new tools and reports we've built to help you measure impact and results. Let's talk about rich previews in search. I'll hazard a guess that you're familiar with the image on the left, standard search results. Since the very beginning of search, these blue links have been incredibly effective at driving discoverability of your content and the growth of your business. You probably already know that by including structured data appropriate to your content, your site can enhance its presence on search and go beyond the traditional blue links. In this example, what was once links to recipe websites is now much more visual, much more engaging. We call these rich snippets. With simple markup, you present a more compelling visual result with reviews, images, and more. When you look at these results side by side, it's clear that rich snippets are much more enticing to the user. More enticing means more clicks, more traffic. Rich snippets help users make more informed decisions with a greater likelihood of user satisfaction and deeper engagement with your site. It's a win-win situation. Users get much more engaging search experiences. Publishers get increased discoverability and traffic to their sites. But we want to use markup to make your content even more engaging to users. We want to take it a step further. We're beginning to roll out a new format, Rich Cards, which makes your evergreen content even more prominent on results pages. Rich Cards further enhance content previews on search results pages. If you're in the kitchen, desperate for your next sugar hit, and I'm always desperate for my next sugar hit, a quick search for dessert recipes will get you a nice swipeable carousel of mouthwatering possibilities. Remember what I mentioned earlier. In these short bursts of digital activity, there isn't much time to grab a user's attention. The more visual and engaging the content, the better. For a user like me, I want to be seduced by that lemon cupcake image and that recipe. I want to tap on it, I want to bake it, I want to eat it. A digitally driven burst of culinary activity. What are rich cards? First, rich cards are built upon rich snippets. It's a further evolution of the same idea. Previewing richer content on search is good for publishers and good for users. Instead of just links, we're able to surface information about events, recipes, and movies in a highly compelling, highly visual fashion. Just like rich snippets, rich cards use schema.org markup to help enhance the previews of a site's content. A rich card is a compartmentalized template of information that can take on multiple forms, depending on where they're displayed. Let's walk through a few examples. Let's say you're waiting for the subway on the, meet, on the way to meet your best friend who's a movie buff. She's annoyingly smart. We all have friends like that. And you need to learn something about great movies so you can be reasonably prepared for the intense debates that always happen when you hang out. You type best movies of all time into search. On the left, you see standard search results with links to relevant sites that have top movie lists. There may be some great information on those sites, but you're not sure. You can hear the rumble of the approaching subway train, so you have very little time to get smart. Now, let's look at the right side. You can see results with a rich card from Time Out New York City. You get a nice visual carousel with previews of the listed movies, lots of visual temptation. You've never heard of Ingmar Bergman's persona. It seems impressively deep and intellectual. Maybe your friend hasn't either. You tap on it, and off you go to the Time Out New York City website. These rich cards can take on many different forms. Let's say you have a cooking website. First, your rich cards can appear as a part of a list of recipes from multiple sites. For example, if you search for pasta recipes, you might find mac and cheese variations from Epicurious.com and the New York Times. I love mac and cheese and I'm hungry for a taste test, so I'll do both. Second, your rich cards can also appear as a list of recipes from just your site. On the right, all of these tempting waistline expanding recipes are from the Food Network. Of course, tap on a recipe, go to that site, start cooking. 
Users are coming to Google billions of times each day with queries just like these. When a publisher's content appears in more places, in richer, more compelling forms, discovery opportunities increase, and those who click are more likely to have a stronger intent to take action, to cook that recipe, to attend an event, to subscribe to a premium feature. Today, the Rich Card program is open for recipes and is being tested for movies. In the future, we'll expand to many other categories of results as well. Creating a Rich Card is simple and only requires structured data markup. Mark up your recipe pages with recipe schema, movie pages with movie schema. You get the idea. Many of you have already done this markup on your pages, and then you add item list markup on the list page that contains all the recipes or movies. We do recommend that you submit a sitemap containing the marked up pages through the Google Search Console. This will also help increase the discoverability of your content. We're just getting started in this area, and we'd like to thank the publishers who participated in early tests. The rest of the effort, of course, just made us hungry for more. We're eager to expand the previewing of rich content throughout search. Users are coming to search for more than just recipes, movies, or events. They're also searching about things that are happening right now. And I mean right now, as in right this moment, not hours ago, not 15 minutes ago. Under the current model, publishers have to wait for Google to index their content. That means the freshest content isn't reaching users at the moment that matters most. Take a look at this chart of searchers during this year's NFL draft. At the start of the draft, queries peaked and remained high throughout the event. These users reacted to the live event and came to search, looking to find fresh information. Maybe they're on their couch, watching the draft on TV, or sneaking a look while sitting in a meeting at work, looking for the latest draft news. This is not unique to sports fans. People are coming to Google for real-time info about all kinds of things, the Oscars, the elections, and of course, breaking news. During the World Cup, searches related to the World Cup peaked at over 20% of all search volume. People come to Google to find information about what is happening now. That led us to think, how can we surface real-time results more quickly and satisfy those real-time spikes in queries? The question kicked off the development of our real-time indexing efforts. Instead of waiting for your content to be crawled and indexed, publishers will be able to use the Google indexing API to trigger the real-time indexing of their content. Users get access to real-time results in search, and publishers increase their discovery and reach. It's an exciting new area, and we're just getting started. We've launched a pilot within the next few months, and we'll roll it out to more publishers over the next year. As you know better than I do, it's not enough to simply appear on the search results page. To grow your business, you need users to engage. But far too often, users are experiencing pages that are awkwardly slow loading. We know people abandon slow loading sites and those occasions end up being lost opportunities, plain and simple. What publisher can afford that? In fact, 40% of people abandon a website that takes more than three seconds to load. With every millisecond, users have to wait for a page to load. They're more likely that they'll give up and simply go someplace else. The experience of reading content on the web today can be painful. We've all had these bad experiences. There's the slow loading web page. Heavy pages to trying to do way too much when the network connection or the device simply isn't up to the task. You can almost feel the page straining under the weight of the data, sucking the life out of the battery and bringing your phone's processor to its knees. All you can do is wait and wait and wait. And then there's that page with the sticky scroll. You start to scroll, you get nothing. No buttery smooth scroll for you. Your finger isn't strong enough to scroll that page. And last but not least, 
that page that seems to fully load, you think it has, and you're happily reading along when all of a sudden a late loading ad or some other component pops in, shifting the content you were trying to read off screen someplace. All you wanted was a compelling read, but apparently the page thinks that you wanted to play hide and seek. An effective user engagement strategy? Mm -hmm, I don't think so. It was challenges like these that were at the core of the initiative that we, together with three dozen publishers and tech companies, started last fall, called the Accelerated Mobile Pages Project. The AMP project is an open source initiative that embodies the vision that publishers can create mobile optimized content once and have it load instantly everywhere to the benefit of their user experiences, their business models, their destinies. It's been amazing to see so many people, so many companies come together and build a solution that would improve the mobile web experience for everyone. Not only publishers, but ad tech companies, analytics companies, discovery platforms, CMS providers. During the development of the project, competitors came together in the same room and collaborated on a common cause. It was really inspiring to see. This is the way it had to be. We felt it was important that a solution be driven by the industry, not just a single player. This way, everyone is invested. Everyone can share their expertise, and we can learn from one another in order to achieve the best possible outcome. Let me share a video that I think captures this collaborative spirit of the AMP project. Let's check it out. Those of us, when we first started playing with the web, the, the great thing was that you could, you could surf. You could go to one site, read something, find a link there, click, you're off to another site. It was the single greatest driver of innovation that we've ever seen. Thanks to smartphones, everybody has internet in their pocket. But the mobile web is really at, at odds with what everybody does on the web, which is surf and browse, and that should all be fast and easy, and right now it just isn't. So this thing which should be a source of utter wonder is a source of frustration. Waiting. Waiting. Not letting me scroll. Now it's loaded. People bounce. So if the, if the page doesn't load within a couple seconds, they move on to the next page. That is the worst possible outcome for everyone involved. So uh, Google, together with dozens of other publishers and technology companies, sat down to try to find a solution for this. And our solution was the AMP project. AMP is a fantastic industry collaborative approach to make mobile web faster. You'll see the benefits of an AMP page when you first go to one. The first thing is instant speed. The next click is only sort of like one little scroll away. More people will see us, more people will see our ads, more people will be able to read our content. We love the ability to style our own pages. It's a great opportunity for us to really look like our brand, feel like our brand. With this sort of open philosophy that uh, it's unfettered and unrestricted and you can do pretty much anything you'd like with it. Publishers can maintain control over their own destinies control over their own products, control over their own business models. And the best way to do that with an engineering project is to make it an open source project. We feel like it's really important that there's not a gatekeeper between a publisher and them reaching their audience. The success of the AMP project is not going to be based on the leadership of one. It's going to be based on the leadership of many. You have a problem that is common to others. You work together to find a common solution. So it's like all of a sudden everybody jumping in and doing stuff and then something comes out which is great. Something that we've needed to do for a very long time as an industry, this is the spirit of the web at its best. Just give it a try. Show up at the GitHub page, read the documentation, see what it would mean for your pages. We shouldn't be fighting over what a hyperlink is anymore. It's time to figure out uh, how to tell the best stories. You know, those of us involved with the AMP project are involved in many regards because we love the web and we want the web to be as vibrant and healthy as all of us know it can be. We want it to be fast and furiously compelling. We want to make the web great again. It's really as simple as that. Can we make the web great again? Who was that guy? <laughs> Thank <laughs> you.
And, and some of you might have noticed that a couple of people in that video have moved on to impressive new opportunities. I think of that as another demonstration of the power of AMP to accelerate careers. <laughs> AMP is very easy to use if you haven't tried it. And its underpinnings should be familiar to anyone creating web content today. We've invited a lot of familiar friends to this party. AMP HTML is HTML with a couple of extra twists and tricks. JavaScript plays an instrumental role via the AMP JavaScript library and within sandboxed components that you can build. CSS continues to be at your disposal for styling. And we've brought smart caching into the model. AMP is based on web technologies and web principles. We didn't want to turn our backs on what makes the web the web. We didn't want to build entirely new technology stacks. Instead, all it took was some imagination to smartly rearrange the existing bits that were already there. Simply stated, it's just-in-time loading of data, just-in-time processing of components, just-in-time rendering of pages. And to be clear, AMP isn't just about instantly surfacing content on Google search or other discovery platforms. It's about building fast, elegant websites. When we bring it all together, we find that an AMP page loads four times faster and uses 10 times less data compared to a non-AMP page. And that doesn't include the added performance benefits when smart caching and pre-rendering are brought into the equation. Like I mentioned earlier, AMP is an open source project. The activity and engagement we've seen has been tremendous and inspiring. Over 7,300 developers have engaged with the effort. There have been over 1,900 code submissions from developers. The project has put out 88 releases so far, about two releases per week. Not bad for a project that's about eight months old. The velocity has been incredible. And I thank each and every one of you who've helped to make that happen. From discovery platforms like Twitter, Line, Pinterest, to CMS providers like WordPress and Drupal, to dozens of analytics providers and ad networks, it's been great to see the momentum behind AMP. But the proof is in the adoption. The adoption curve is remarkable. We've seen 125 million AMP documents in our index from over 640,000 domains from every corner of the globe, and it continues to increase every day. Just like many publishers, Google is also making good use of AMP. Earlier this year, we launched AMP news carousels within Google Search on the mobile web. And that makes it easier than ever to get discovered on Google Search. With AMP news carousels, users can not only read instantly loading articles, but swipe between articles that also load instantly. Now, I'm not a rocket scientist, but I know that we can't expand the amount of time in the day but we can help users consume more content in the time they do have. We're now expanding AMP both within search and across other Google properties, like the recently launched Google News and Weather app in the United States edition. Over the next several weeks, we'll be rolling out the AMP experience to the iOS and Android Google search apps as well, and we'll continue beyond that. We're also working to bring AMP to new types of content. We just started to experiment with combining rich cards in AMP. When you combine the two, users get an incredibly rich and fast experience. Users can tap on your rich card and view a recipe instantly. They can preview more recipes instantly by swiping left or right within the carousel, thanks to the instant nature of AMP. We're launching this experience first with recipes and plan to support many other content types soon. AMP will also be part of the real-time indexing effort that I talked about earlier. Now let's take a look at the tools we built to help you measure the results of the features I've talked about. Search Console helps you monitor and maintain your site's presence on Google Search. If you haven't done it so far, we strongly recommend you verify ownership of your site in Search Console. It provides many tools to improve the search experience for your content. 
We've added a new report to Search Console that will help you understand you have implementation errors in rich cards. It'll even suggest which cards can benefit from additional markup. To use the tool, just log into Search Console and select the rich card report. The report will show you the overall status for your site. In this case, you can see the site has done a fine job and they don't have any invalid cards. They do, however, have many cards on the site that can benefit from marking up more fields. We mark them as enhanceable cards. The report will also show you examples of any errors down to the specific field on a specific URL. It can also guide you to the updated structured data testing tool. The structured data testing tool allows you to run a live test on your pages. This can highlight all the errors and enhancement opportunities you have on your cards. This is one of the most popular tools and is incredibly useful for stamping out problems before they occur. You can even simulate how your card will actually look on the search results page by using the newly added preview functionality. It was highly requested and it should make the tool ever more effective. The AMP project, by the way, also provides a mechanism to validate AMP files. In Search Console, we surface AMP errors in your crawled AMP content to make it easier for you to address any fixes. This includes the structured data requirements for AMP features like the Top Stories carousel. We also recently launched an AMP report that shows impression, click, and CTR data for just your AMP content. You can try the feature today by simply logging into your Search Console account, go to the Search and Analytics report, and filter to AMP for search types. You can even compare how AMP metrics stack against other search features like your search result links. AMP has been a, a very fast-moving initiative, as I noted. And we want to thank the many AMP developers who've contributed not only valuable feedback, but code, and helped us tweak the tools I'm talking about here as the project evolved. For some hands-on experience, check out the Sandbox. We have members from our developer relations and product teams to answer any and all questions and show you live demos. That was a lot to cover in a half an hour, so let's take a moment to, to recap what we talked about today. We talked about how you can preview richer content in search for increased discovery. We announced our efforts in real-time indexing to help connect users with the most up-to-date content you offer. We showed how AMP can drive blazingly fast consumption across the mobile web, and how we're working to bring it to new surfaces and new content types. And finally, we walked through the new rich card and AMP reports and the updated structured data testing tool. To learn more, check out these sessions that deep dive into the individual topics. And again, if you're interested in getting some hands-on time with these tools or to review documentation, please stop by our sandbox and that you can do any time during the rest of I.O. Google Search looks completely different from 17 years ago. And that's the point. And as you heard yesterday in Sundar's keynote, Google is continuing to evolve. Although search may look different, content discovery is still at the core of everything we do. Whether that discovery comes from the search results page or the interfaces of the future, such as the Google Assistant or Allo or Google Home, we want to make sure that integrating and growing with Google is as easy as possible. Definitely stay tuned as we'll have much more to announce as more and more features and capabilities move from concept to reality. As I mentioned at the beginning, I believe Google and publishers share a common cause. I'm excited to see so many people come together to ensure that the next billion users can experience the same magic and universal access to information that we've all enjoyed over the first 25 years of the web's history. I thank you very much.